Hello, in this video we're going to talk about interpreting the phase space. So definition, a phase space of a dynamical system is a space in which all possible states of the system are represented. A phase portrait or diagram shows the trajectory of initial conditions. All right, so let's take a look at an example and this is just an introduction. We will dive into this concept in more detail as we move on in our course. So as an example, a ball is thrown upward with initial velocity 39.2 meters per second. The height above the ground is given by the position function s of t equals negative 4.9 t squared plus 39.2 meters. Let's create three plots. The first plot, let's create a graph of position versus time. Secondly, create a graph of velocity versus time. And third, create a graph of velocity versus position. And that third graph will be our phase portrait for this system. Okay, so I have a table of data here. So for time equals zero up through eight, I've plotted the position s of t and the velocity v of t using the position function given and our first derivative. Recall that the first derivative of position equals velocity and that's something we remember from calc 1. Okay so let's do our plot. In this plot we're plotting t and we're plotting s. Okay, now this is a continuous model because the height could be measured at really any time t, not just at these integer values. So we can connect the dots here and we get this nice parabola for our position function. Okay, great. Let's keep going. Now let's plot velocity. And so we notice that velocity looks like a linear function and again we could actually compute the velocity from our first derivative. Okay, so far so good. So now let's take a look at the phase portrait for this system. So in this plot, we're going to be plotting our position and our velocity. So let's start there. At time equals zero, our position is zero and velocity is 39.2. So position is zero and our velocity is about 39.2. We'll put a dot right there. And our next data point is when position is 34, our velocity is a little bit less, it's about 29.2. When our position is 58.8, velocity is 19.6. And if we connected the dots, what we get is we get the trajectory of our initial condition, initial condition being whatever our initial velocity was. And there's a direction of flow here. And I'd like to consider that direction a little bit more. So if we look at the change in position and the change of velocity, for example, if we do the change, if we subtract 34.3 minus 0, that turns out to be a 34.3. And similarly, if we subtract 29.4 and 39.2 to get our change in velocity, that's a negative 9.8. Okay, so let's take a look at one particular line of data. So let's look right here. When time equals 1, What does this say? It says that from time equals zero to time equals one, our change in position is positive and our change of velocity is negative. In other words, when we're starting off at this point, the change as we go from time equals zero to time equals one, we're heading in the positive s direction, the positive position function, and we're going to head in the negative velocity function. And so what that gives us is it gives us an arrow that's pointing to the right and down. 
Okay, and that's why that arrow is pointing to the right and down. And similarly, if we keep going, we have positive change in position with a negative change in velocity. And so we have all of these arrows pointing in that direction. Notice that when we start to go the other direction, as the ball has reached its highest point in the sky, now the position is going to start decreasing and the velocity is also becoming more negative. Now, how would this change if we had a different initial velocity? Well, if we had a different initial velocity, we would still have the same direction of flow. Maybe the ball would not go as high. Or maybe if we threw the ball with greater initial velocity, the ball would go higher, but the, still the trajectory is very similar. And so you see that for this dynamical system, we could also draw a phase portrait. Okay. There's also a equilibrium point, which is don't throw the ball at all. It will stay on the ground and it won't move. But as soon as you start to throw the ball with a little bit of velocity, it will go up and come back down. Okay, so let's talk about qualitative interpretation of phase portraits. The sorts of things we're going to be looking for are attractors, and those attractors can come in a different couple of different flavors. They can be stable attractors like a sink or an unstable attractor like a source. We also might find limit cycles, strange attractors like we saw in the chaos video, and we also want to be looking for basins of attraction. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. For the first example, I'd like you to imagine a ball resting on top of a hemisphere or maybe a ball resting on top of a, a hill. So let me try to draw a visualization. So here's a hill or a dome or a hemisphere. Okay, so that's a solid sort of object. And we've got a ball resting right on the top. All right, so that is an equilibrium point, but this is an unstable equilibrium. And this is an unstable equilibrium because as soon as I start to tap that ball to one side, it's going to roll right down the mountain or roll right down the edge of the hemisphere. Okay, we could represent that in a phase portrait. We could say, okay, you know, this is an equilibrium point. If it's perfectly balanced on top of the mountain, it won't move. But given one little nudge, it's going to move in the direction that it's nudged. Okay, and this is what we call a source. This is unstable because the direction of flow is outward. Let's take a look at a different example. In this example, let's imagine a ball resting at the bottom of a bowl. So this time, let's draw a bowl. Okay, And here's our ball sitting at the bottom of that bowl. This is also an equilibrium, but this is actually a stable equilibrium. Because if I nudge the ball a little bit in any direction, the ball will return to rest. So if I put the ball up here, the ball is going to move back down to its resting position. If we put that in a diagram, you see any position off of that bottom of the bowl, the ball will tend to roll towards the bottom or the center, the origin of that bowl. And this is called a stable attractor. This is a stable equilibrium point. Lastly, let's look at a predator-prey situation. So imagine we've got zebras and lions, and the zebras are prey. The lions are the predator, and let's assume that the lions only eat zebras. They don't have any other food source. So as soon as the zebras disappear, the lions are going to be hungry, starving, and decrease their population. Similarly, we'll assume that zebras have no other predators. So if there's not a lot of lions around, the zebra's population will continue to grow. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of different regions in this graph. So the first region I want to take a look at is this first area right here. 
Okay, in this region, both populations are increasing. So the zebras population is increasing, the lion population is increasing, um, and, and things are good for everybody. Look at our next region here. So in this next region, in this region right in here, what's going on is that the zebra population is decreasing. So our zebra population is going down, the lion population continues to increase, and there is heavy predation going on, and that's what's driving the zebra population down. The zebra population then gets so small that it starts to cause the lion population to go down. Okay, next let's take a look at this region right here. In this next region, what's going on? Well, here the lions were at a peak, but their food source is running out. And so now the lion population starts to decrease, the zebra population is still decreasing, and so here, we'll say zebras are going down, the lions are going down, and the lions are starving. Pretty soon the zebra population gets to pick back up. All right, so the in this region right here, the lions are still decreasing, the zebras are increasing. There is light predation in this region. And lastly, let's take a look at this region right over here. What's happening in this region? In this region, we've got both the lions going back up, the zebras are going up, and the cycle continues. Let's take a look at this region right here. So we've got lions and zebras. Everyone is increasing. So we're moving in the positive lion direction, the positive zebra direction. Everyone is increasing. After a while though, we get to a point where the zebra population starts to decrease. Lions are still increasing. So the zebras are going down, lions are still increasing. And let's label these with some colors. So this represents the yellow region. This came from the green region. Time goes by and now what happens? The lions have reached their maximum population. They start to decline. Our zebras are also declining. Okay, and let's label that with a particular color here corresponding to the graph. Then what happens? The lions are decreasing in population. There's light predation. The zebras start to make a rebound. That did not have a color on the graph. And now we're back to increasing again. And that's colored with the pink. So what happens? Over time, these populations around they go and this is what's known as a limit cycle. Okay, so this is what is known as a limit cycle. This is classic in these sort of oscillating systems. This is a classic predator-prey example, um, and that's another type of attractor you could see.